I was once working in the Manx Museum Library, as I often do, and I was working on Balaf. I was working on an article for the Balaf Heritage Trust newsletter, and I came across, if you read, if you read the material for Balaf, you'll come across material for Angus and Bride and so on, and I was struck by this particular phrase called, Ask Now of the Days That Have Passed. It comes from Deuteronomy, it comes from uh, verse 14, chapter, th chapter 4, verse 32. It was preached by the Reverend Joey Qualtro at the 1876 Andrus Harvest Thanksgiving, so I couldn't make use of that for Balak. I thought there was no way I could write something about Balak that uses something that was preached in Andrus, I thought, no way, I can't actually do this. But I think this very much sums up my particular research, and so this very much is the leaf motif of my particular work, is to ask now of the days that have passed. You might see an echo in this of a book that was published in 1956 by George Ewart Evans called Ask the Fellows Who Cut the Hay. Ewart Evans was a Welsh school teacher. He lived in a very remote part of Suffolk at Blacksall. And he's noticed in the community there the change in work practices on the land, mechanisation coming in, changes in the social life of the village. And he decided to record it. He was the first person to really do this. He sort of kick-started the oral history movement in England. And what he produced were these very simple, plain accounts of life on the land. There's no notion of nostalgia, there's no elegiac notion of a past life. He basically tells it as it is, hardship and all. And the reason why I mention you at Evans, quite apart from the fact that books are well worth reading, is that an anthology was published recently, well 1993 was posthumous anthology, and this incorporates material from all of his other books, and I'm going to read a review from this particular book here. It says, it's right that the past should be heard of in the words of those who lived it. Those who actually cut the hay. Fantastic review. And this, I have to say to my own self, this is what I have actually done. I have indeed asked those here in the island who cut the hay. Those who fish for cod off the island, Ronnie Christian, other people like these I meet. Those who gathered seaweed off the beach at Port St. Mary, that was Breesha's grandfather. I interviewed Breesha's grandfather in here. I even met one of the last to sail to Kinsale for the mackerel fishing there. He sailed in 1912. He was a 13-year-old cook. And the reason why he knows it's 1912 is because the Titanic went past him on the way. <laughs> These are the sort of the voices that I have actually heard here. And uh, funny enough, by an absolute power, by a serendipity today, I was in the Manx Museum in the reading room, and I was talking to Wendy Thurkettle about my tapes. And she produced me a box of tapes. And on one of those tapes was the tapes with Alfie, Re Alfie Tate. And he was the person I interviewed, one of the first people I interviewed. He was a night watchman at the old Imperial buildings in the steam packet. And I remember turning up there to be told about what life was like on board a fishing vessel going to Kinsale in 1912. And so uh, I was also surprised this morning to realise I've not got one box of tapes in the Manx Museum Library. I've got three boxes of tapes in the Manx Museum Library. And that is me the next summer just simply listening to my tapes, trying to figure out who's on them and what they're all really about. Because I don't have documentation for them, you know. But I, anyway, no matter from that. Okay, I have heard the voices of many, many other people. I want to sort of perhaps move quite strangely now onto a German filmmaker, a person called Edgar Ritz, who made an amazing TV series called Heimat. And uh, he was actually in Vienna recently last year. There was a retrospective of his work. Heimat was basically the life of a fictional village in the Hundred, which is where he comes from. It's a small area, just a simple, simple area like the Isle of Man. It's just a simple farming community in the Hundsrug, it's in the Lower Rhineland. But the interesting thing about Rees was that uh, he just didn't want to live there. He was one of these people who as soon as he could get out, got out, became a filmmaker, his career stalled, he ended up back in the Hundsrug, living with his parents, and around him he saw, just like Ewart Evans, the change in the life in the Hunsrug. And he remember him saying in this particular, and he realised that his, his grandfather, for instance, was, was the village blacksmith. And he realised that this was going. He says, these are the last people to work with their hands. They're working at crafts that have now gone. And he says, once they are gone, we cannot ask them again. And he says, someone must bear witness to the work that they do. Someone has to bear witness to the life that they lived. And that's what I very much feel that I have actually done. You know, I've been witness to the lives that have been lived in this island, witness to the work that's been done on the land, the work that's been done at the sea as well. But I also am well aware that I'm not the only witness on the island. Whilst I've recorded many voices, I've also read the words of many others in the files of the Folklife Survey. This, for instance, is one thing I was reading recently. The harvest was very late. In some places, corn was cut in the month of October. The year, in fact, is 1879. 
The reason why we know it's 1879 is because Robert Wilcrane of Balath was standing in the field with his father as a 10 year old. This is the sort of memories that stretch back in the island through the Manx Museum Folk Life Survey, through the other people who have gone and asked the previous people of the days past. John Neen the Gow, the sort of the pin up of the Manx language uh, revival, John John Gow dictated his memories to his daughter in 1948. This is a man who was born in 1860. These are the sort of voices, the Manx voices, that we have access to in this particular island. A man born before the American Civil War broke out. Incredible. And we have in the Folk Life Survey an ethnographic archive that stands as an achievement along the lines of the Irish Folklore Commission and the School of Scottish Studies. Leslie Quirk, who was one of the field workers for the Folk Life Survey, was actually trained by the Irish Folklore Commission. The Irish Folklore Commission visited the Isle of Man. Their first sound recordings done were of the last native speakers of Manx. Eric Regina worked on the survey, later went to the School of Scottish Studies. Basil McGall later followed from the Manx Museum to the School of Scottish Studies. But this archive is little known, it's little used, and there are so many Manx voices in there that need to be heard again. It is thanks to Leslie Quirk, whose name I see on here, and Walter Clark as well, many others, Eric Regina and many others, and especially Grace Mary Quilliam as a field worker and organisational ex- the extraordinaire of the Folk Life Survey that we have this, this particular archive. Just this week, I was, I was reading the early correspondence of the Folk Life Survey, and I came across this letter written by Grace Mary Quilliam to the Gow's daughter, Millie Neans, from 1948. And it says here, I like to imagine some student a hundred years from now looking into our files to find what life was like then, and reading your book and the facts we collected ourselves from your father. Well, I have turned up a little bit earlier than that. I didn't wait a hundred years to turn up to read uh, the Gow's reminiscences and that of many others. And as uh, Sarah Christian sitting here, who works in the Manx Museum and also representing here the Blaf Heritage Trust and the Alman Family History Society, knows that I've read a lot of files from the Folk Life Survey. In fact, Sarah, I counted them up today and I've called up 114 files from the Folk Life Survey. And there's always one more file to read. There's always one more item to call up from the Folk Life Survey. It is an absolutely remarkable archive. So I'm well aware that whilst I'm a witness, there are previous witnesses from me, and we have a remarkable resource here that can actually take us back into the middle of last century. So I want to thank also, I want to thank Kim Holden from the Manx Museum Library as well. She also uncovered one of the original notebooks of Leslie Quirks, an absolutely incredible find, as she just found this by chance and came this to me, and we could recognize the handwriting, we could recognize it. That's the sort of a treasure that lies in there. What I want to now move on is move on to this wonderful phrase here, Manx is all the go in the island now. This doesn't come from me, by the way. This is Edward Farragher writing to Carl Roder. This is the obligatory Carl Roder reference. Everyone knows me. There's got to be a reference to Carl Roder in everything that I talk about. And so this is one of the many references in tonight. But it's also all the go now in the island. I have to admit to myself, that I never thought in my life I would be standing in a building like this, that there would be an organisation like called Jovanen dedicated to promoting and celebrating our heritage. I never thought I would see it. And this is much more than just a set of static displays, wonderful as the Lego is in here, <laughs> although I still want to see the Boy Scout who threw the sod of earth at Raglan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why not? Why not? Something missing. There's always something missing. Folklore will always tell you there's something missing. Something that should have been recorded. Somebody should have been interviewed. So that's what's missing, missing, missing. Maybe I can make that up one time and bring that along uh, next, next in the island. But in all seriousness, absolutely fantastic to see an organisation like this. What I also never thought I'd ever see in my lifetime is a primary school that teaches through the medium of Manx. I'm of the generation that have no Manx. As simple as that. I mean, I find it difficult to pronounce the trophy that I've been awarded, I'll be honest about that. I remember talking to my mother when Brian Stoll was teaching at the Isle of Man College, teaching night, night class at the Isle of Man College. We told her, no, you don't want to learn that. It's dead language, you know, no one speaks that. It's, 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 it's just simply, simply not, not worth it. And so it is remarkable to see, see the bone skull, and we know that our language is not as the famous letters that has been sent to UNESCO. They've been told very clearly that the language is still here. And as we know now, thanks to the Cronky Berry School kids, it's also out there in the cosmos as well. <laughs> it's also fantastic to see. I hope Culture Van is going to arrange a trip out there one day. You know, we can all, we can all go out there. 
better than going to Ramsey, you know. We can actually, anyway, and I have to be to Ramsey tonight actually because I left, I left my luggage on the bus, so we've actually had a little trip to uh, a little bit of excitement this afternoon. Not just this award, actually, trying to get my luggage, and it is possible to go from St John's to Ramsey and back in the same day. That's something else. That I'm <laughs> so that's another little takeaway for you here at this this particular talk. Okay, let's get a little bit serious now if I can rise to the occasion. Okay, you know, Paul Cain in 1891 wrote a book called The Little Mouse Nation. And I want to sort of tease this, this idea apart. I take the little, not in the sense that he meant the little, to mean that we are numerically small as Manx people. We've always been small on the island here. There was a census in 1726, Bishop Wilson had them count everyone. And the number came to just under 14,500. It's remarkable. That's all we were, 14,500. And yet we're still here. We also had, as you know, the 19th century, people left. It's an incredibly poignant line here, I find from the Andrew School logbook here from 1869. Three little girls left, gone to America, Christeries. Having to leave the island. I always wonder what life did they make in America, you know? Who are they now? Where are their descendants now? You know, do they still feel Manx in any particular way? Did they bring that with them? I don't know. Are we Manx? Well, if we use the language as a marker, you can simply say it's always been here. Let's not get into these arguments about last native speakers and continuity of Manx and so on. You can simply say, if you want to get those arguments, the language fell asleep at Ned Madrill in 1974, and now it's woken up. Go next door if you doubt that particular phrase. And Manx has been here. Yeah, we moved into the English-speaking realm around about 1399, when you look at it. You know, we've had over 500 years here of an English-speaking elite, and yet the language is still here. When we talk about being a nation, well, to me it's actually quite, se quite self-evident that we're a nation. All you have to do is look across there to see a tin world. We have sitting in here, we have someone here who's not a member of parliament, who's an MHK. You know, that's our parliament, brought to us by the Norse. Brought to us by our Viking ancestors. Our last king died in 1265, Magnus Olofsson. But our parliament is still here. Once again, that is what stood. Changes in administration in this island. The Stanley's moving to the Derby, he's moving to the revestment and so on and all of this. Our parliament is still here. We're here, our language is here, and our institutions are still here. Reflecting both sides of us, reflecting us both as Celts and as Vikings is here. I'm going to move on now to a particular closing Comment. I've actually got through this talk a little quicker than I thought it was going to be. A little bit quicker than I thought. It's actually quite good. I've made all the points I want to make and I want to keep it short and sharp. If we know who we were as that little mouse nation, the better we are then to understand who we are now as that little mouse nation and also who we will be and can be in the future. And I think that can only come from us looking back and looking at the mouse the nation that it used to be. Now many people might think that's the closing mark, that's the takeaway message, but I actually want to add another little message to that, and this is perhaps, I would think to myself, this is a particular note of caution, and I want to read this in a, in a bit, lot bit uh, read this, read this much, much more fuller. This is Edward Farragher recalling Margaret's cottage at Craig Niche. Margaret got the cottage from her mother, Old Nelly, who Edward Farragher described as a tyrant. <laughs> and apparently when Old Nelly passed off and off this mortal coil that was taken over, taken over by Mark and it sort of became some like party central, party HQ and Craig Nish, judging from Farragher's description and I'll read it to you now. She lived in the house alone and it was a great haunt for the young men. She used to learn us to sing and dance. It was a meeting house for both sexes for many years. When she died the house went to ruin. The little garden in front has disappeared and Margaret's old haggard is trodden like the highway. Farragut now lies, as you know, in an unmarked grave in England. And finally, he writes these particular words, which are taken, I take these as metaphorical, not literal. And he himself lies in an unmarked grave in England. You know, his great friend, Rhoda, towards the end of his day, lived in close poverty. He actually had to have a subscription list raised to actually buy him his medicine in his last, in his, in his last life. You know, it's actually terrible. But I think my takeaway message for the night, if there is a takeaway message tonight, is that if Margaret's old haggard, in other words, what makes us Manx, is not to be trodden like the highway now or in the future, I think let us ever and again ask now the days that have passed and listen to those Manx voices to remind us of where we came from. And we are small in number. We will always be small in number. 
But I think we need to stop being just the shy in the words of T.E. Brown and speak that much louder about who we are and what we are as that little mouse nation. And I'll come to a final word, I think, if there's a soundbite to take away from this, what I've learned from asking people that I realised very soon on, it's not Halloween, it's Hop Tune. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you very much. And that's enough of me. And thank you very much.